p.m. Allow me to, in the official form, recognize and acknowledge political leader of the Barbados Civil Party and Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Moore Motley. I also recognize Deputy Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw. Allow me also to recognize members of Parliament, members of the Senate, members of the Diplomatic Corps. I also take great pleasure in recognizing and acknowledging members of the National Executive Council of the Barbados Stable Party, members of the Adams family. Allow me to also recognize and acknowledge our featured lecturer tonight, His Excellency Chad Blackman. And I take added pleasure in also recognizing members of the various arms of the Barbados Civil Party, members of the Women's League, as well as members of the League of Young Socialists. To our distinguished guests who are here gathered, we also take great pride in recognizing and acknowledging you. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades, a very pleasant good night. The father of democracy. Tonight, this will be our focus, and it will be the singular focus of our featured presenter. And as we celebrate 85 years, we do so with great pride. We do so recognizing our firm commitment to this beautiful island, Barbados. We do so knowing full well that those who have gone before us have certainly created a mark, a signature, a stamp that cannot in any way be erased, but one that certainly speaks well, not only of the work of Barbados Civil Party, but of our country, Barbados. And so tonight, this, as I noted earlier, will be our focus. I'm Antoine Williams, my pleasure in serving as your master of ceremonies. Allow me now to welcome the one who will make it warm for you in terms of her welcoming remarks. I take great pleasure now in inviting first vice chairman of the Barbados Civil Party, the Honorable Kay McConney, to offer the welcome. Master of Ceremonies, thank you very much. A warm good evening to all of you. My name is Kay McConney, and in my capacity as the first vice chair of the Barbados Labor Party, I have the privilege and certainly the pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our chair, our political leader, and our prime minister, the Honorable Mia Moore Motley, on behalf of the executive and the National Council of the Barbados Labor Party, on behalf of the staff and the members and all of the many supporters who, even if they do not support our party, they support the legacy of the man who is featured tonight. Your presence here reinforces the significance of the life and the legacy of the right excellence, Sir Grantley Adams, even today not only in the story of this political party as we celebrate our 85th anniversary, but more fundamentally, in the story of this country and in the story of this Caribbean region. This evening's lecture is the first in the Barbados Labor Party's 85th anniversary lecture series, and we imagine that there would be more interesting things that you will continue to support as we go forward in this year of celebration. This lecture tonight will take us to our roots. Every organization in every country has its roots. The right excellent Sir Grant Lee Adams is a seminal part of the root system, not only of the Barbados Labor Party and the Barbados Workers Union, but also of this country and other institutions that were birthed either through his vision or through his effort and tenacity. My welcome is to this lecture, yes. But more fundamentally, though, it is a welcome to your experience of a phenomenal story that continues to live in the institutions, in the ideals, and in the inspiration of the honored Right Excellent Sir Grantley. Barbados is truly a grateful nation for his efforts as the father of democracy. 
Many of us take given as given some of the democratic rights we have today, but there were rights for which he had to fight, him and others with him. You will no doubt hear of his successful efforts in the modernization of Barbados from the presenter tonight, so I will not preempt the lecture. I must, however, offer my gratitude for his work in education. He opened the gates to free secondary education with the establishment of Princess Margaret School, which also sits in my constituency of St. Philip West. And also in the provision of technical training at the Technical Institute, which was the forerunner to the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic, and also, which is now called the SJPI. There is so much to learn about his legacy, and I have no doubt that tonight's lecture will open minds and build bridges, not just to the past that is our national hero, but also to create a future into which we must all now transform. And before I hand over to the General Secretary, Senator Doctor, the Honorable Jerome Walcott, who will introduce the presenter, I want to say that it is truly my honor to be part of this amazing organization called the Barbados Labor Party. May we not only find roots in the legacy of the right excellent Sir Grant Lee Adams, may we also find new courage to go farther and higher faster. Because while he rests in blessed memory, we hope that the best of him will continue to rise in us as we now are at this very critical juncture where we are defining and redefining our mission to transform our nation. I welcome you. Grantley Adams and the crafting of our nation for the times. An interesting topic. One that I'm sure that you are all eager to hear from our featured presenter. So I wish now to invite the one who has the distinct pleasure of introducing our featured speaker slash lecturer, comrade, friend. Let's welcome Senator, or General Secretary, Senator Dr. the Most Honorable Jerome Walcott. Thank you. Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Motley, Deputy Prime Minister, Santia Bradshaw, members of the cabinet, members of parliament, sorry, and the president of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Dame Billy Miller, uh, Sir Richard Cheltenham, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Executive and National Council of the Barbados Labour Party, distinct members of the Adams family, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good evening to you all. This evening, I have been assigned the delightful task of introducing our guest lecture. If I follow the old adage that life begins at 40, then his life has only just started. He is a relatively young man, I would say, whose maturity of thought and knowledge of local and world politics impressed me from the first time I met him about 15 years ago. More recently, as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, I was fascinated by his ability to work tirelessly for and on behalf of our country in the role of Barbados' ambassador to the UN at Geneva. Born in 1982 and raised in Vauxhall Christchurch, he attended the Vauxhall Primary School, recently renamed the Shirley Chisholm Primary, a project with which he was integrally involved. Thereafter, he went on to the Christchurch Foundation School and subsequently to the Barbados Community College, where he obtained an associate degree in foreign languages. He is fluent in French and Spanish and conversant in German. Indeed, 14 years ago, while working for Serial Technologies as a French-Spanish translator, he translated the website of one of that company's clients 
from English into Spanish and French. He has always been driven by a passion for civic and community engagement, and at 18 became the parish ambassador of Christ Church, and at 21, the president of the Barbados Youth Development Council. That same year, he also became the CARICOM Youth Ambassador of Barbados, where he championed the cause of the CARICOM single market and economy amongst young people in the region, and founded in Barbados, the CSME Warriors, a national new movement to promote the modalities of the CSME. This grandson of a late Speaker of the House of Assembly and Representative of St. Peter and political firebrand, Mr. Burton Hines, naturally joined the Barbados Labour Party in 2002 and was subsequently elected President of the League of Young Socialists. In that role, he had a distinguish, the distinction of hosting the inaugural Caribbean Young Labour Conference in Barbados. He also worked as a youth commissioner with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports for a short period. Upon moving to the United Kingdom in 2010, he worked as a youth development consultant at the Commonwealth Secretariat and later read for LLB in law and an LLM in international trade law at the University of Essex and later joined the Inner Temple. Specializing in international trade law and data protection law, he joined Global Partners International in St. Lucia as lead consultant for that firm's EU General Data Protection Regulation Advisory Team, which we now speak of GDP, GDPR, and led that company's GDPR partnership with Deloitte of Barbados on delivering compliance of the European Union's regulation to Caribbean clients. In addition, he advised the firm's Caribbean and global clients on international trade and the functioning of the WTO. During the lead up to our historic general elections victory of 2018, he served as a campaign manager for the Honorable Charles Griffith in the constituency of St. John. Later in October of that year, he was appointed at the age of 35 as Barbados' youngest ever ambassador to the United Nations and other international organizations at Geneva. This included the World Trade Organization, the World Inter Intellectual Property Organization, and of course the ILO. His mandate was also expanded and he became ambassador to the UN at Vienna to represent us at the IAEA and also to Rome where he represented us at the FAO. And of course was Barbados' ambassador to Austria, Switzerland, Hungary, and Serbia, the first for these latter three countries. During his four-year tenure, he had various positions in Geneva, including chair of the CARICOM group, coordinator of the small island developing states in the UN, chair of the trade and development and trade and environment committees, respectively, in the WTO, the first chair of the accession committee for Curacao at the WTO, and the Vice President of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. In 2022, he was appointed President of the Group of 77 in China and served on the Global Board of the UN International Gender Champions. Ladies and gentlemen, I can attest to the fact that he was held in extremely high esteem by several of his ambassadorial colleagues in Geneva. Since February, as after relapsed relax last year, he has been a visiting lecturer at the Geneva School of Diplomacy, where he teaches a module on trade and development in their executive master's program. In October 2022, he was appointed senior advisor to the new director general of the International Labour Organization and serves in his cabinet. He holds cabinet responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean and is now responsible for the African continent, the United Nations, as well as the organization's external relations, legal department, and ILO administrative tribunal. Comrades, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my special pleasure to introduce Ambassador Chad Blackman, who by his several achievements personifies hard work both at home and abroad on behalf of his fellow man and his country. It is only fitting that I now ask him to deliver this year's Grandy Adams Memorial Lecture.
Political Leader and Prime Minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Santia Bradshaw, General Secretary, Senator Dr. the Most Honorable Jerome Walker, members of the National Executive, members of the Senate, members of the Parliamentary Group, members of Cabinet, both past and present, General Secretary of the Barbados Workers' Union, in whose house we are, elders of the Labour Party, members of the family of Sir Grantley Adams, Dame Billy Miller, Sir Richard Cheltenham, Sir Gordon Greenwich, members and comrades all, the diplomatic corps, especially invited guests. A warm good evening to all of you. A warm good evening to all of you. Thank you. It is certainly good to be home, and home in the context not just of Barbados, but in the home of the Labour Party. It is truly an honour for me to be asked to deliver this lecture this evening to you. Today is both a very proud and humbling moment for me, having been asked to deliver today's lecture under the theme, Grantly Adams and the Crafting of Our Nation for the Times. The gathering of all of us here today, however, must not be lost on us in terms of the alignment of many moving historical parts which are taking place. For who could have imagined, and I repeat, who could have imagined that 85 years after the Barbados Labour Party was started by Grantley Adams himself, that the lecture in his name would be delivered at a time when our party's leader is the first woman in the history of Barbados to be Prime Minister. In the very place that he, along with others in his day, were founders of, namely the Barbados Workers' Union, which incidentally, as we know, is led by the General Secretary, Comrade Tony Moore, and a member of Parliament in the Labour Party, who also is a sitting member of the governing body of the International Labour Organization, as well as, as a time when our Minister of Labour, the Honorable Colin Jordan, also sits on the governing body of the ILO. With today's lecture being delivered by the senior advisor to the office holder of the person who leads global labor in the entire United Nations, who also is the first African Director General of the ILO. Therefore, if ever there was a doubt in your mind as to the historical and eternal link, and I repeat, if ever there was a doubt in your mind as to the historical and eternal link between the Barbados Labour Party and the labour movement, whether locally or globally, surely the time for that doubt to be removed is now. Tonight, as I set out to explore and to reflect on the mammoth contribution and legacy of the father of our modern democracy and architect of our liberation of our people from the grip of less than ideal living conditions. I will share with you the journey of his life from his time in Barbados as a young man, going through to his time abroad in England at Oxford, his return to Barbados, the realities and challenges of the day in Barbados and the region, his contribution to the local political movement and the creation of the Barbados Labour Party and the Barbados Workers' Union, and his role and challenges in the West Indies Federation and the ultimate contribution through his policies that created the platform for empowerment and development that this great nation has since been built upon. Additionally, I will share with you some of my own reflections using both the blueprint that he has left us in the party to outline a few key things that I truly believe personally will further allow us to deliver our party's motto in creating a better life for our people. Now, at a time when Barbados and its people, still a colony of Britain, 
and facing some of the most dire and challenging of circumstances. Grantley Adams was born on the 28th of April, 1898, to his father, Fitzherbert Adams, and mother, Rosa Frances Turney, and grew up in Government Hill, St. Michael. Incidentally, his humble home was located on the opposite side of the mansion of the then governor of Barbados, Sir James Hay. Now this contrast, as you will see further, will become reflective as we go on tonight, relative to the contrast of the realities of those living in our land and the many battles that laid ahead in ensuring that the conditions of our people would become more equal and more favorable through the dismantling of the status quo of the day by Adams himself. These conditions saw harvests that left a lot to be desired, underscored by dwindling prices that affected the agricultural sector, which of course was the country's bread and butter at the time. Just one year prior to his birth, a royal commission had declared that a very serious set of affairs would be fast approaching the Caribbean, and in addition, a crisis would materialize in a short few years thereafter. For Barbados in particular, the reality of chances for Barbados seemed particularly dire. This was evident as it was Barbados's only industry that it could rely upon, and that was the king of the day, as we all know, sugar, not without its own inherent challenges. Now at the time, the white oligarch structure was at the height of the societal structure and enjoyed a quality of life that was within the aspiration of the black masses, but far removed from both their reach and realities. Never in their wildest imaginations could imagine that the structure of the day, imagine that a young boy, a gifted boy, would later go on to both challenge and take the sting out of the hegemony that they had hitherto enjoyed for centuries. Now as a boy, Adams attended the St. Giles School, where his father was the schoolmaster. Today we call them principals. His father, placing great premium in the ethos of discipline and the rod of correction, Adams and his siblings grew up with a great appreciation for walking the straight and narrow path. Attending church was a must in the household, with Adams' father being at the center of life and affairs of the St. Barnabas Anglican Church. So strong was his belief and conviction in these virtues of discipline and respect for the holy days that the playing of games on Sunday were deemed forbidden. And to whistle in the house on such a day was both unthinkable and a serious no-go. I must admit that it is indeed remarkable to me personally that some 80 years after Adam's dad's rule, it transcend transcended into the late 1980s where my own father would have the same very reaction by saying to me if I whistle on a Sunday, not in here, you think he's a man? Adams' father, ever the disciplinarian, placed great emphasis on the attainment of education for his children. Adams, by way of winning a scholarship, gained entry into Harrison College. Now during his time, he developed the art of having rigorous and intellectual debates with his father much to the amazement of those within sight. This led to the pursuing of the classics whilst at secondary school, as well as the beginning of questioning the societal construct of the day and seeking to proffer new ideas as to what the society should look like and what it should be at its core. This his father welcomed, as he somehow knew that within the bosom of Grantley Adams, therein lied someone who wasn't, extre who was, wasn't only extremely gifted but someone who could one day challenge and critique the very societal norms of the day. Adams at the time, however, wasn't without perceived flaw, as it was said in his school reports that he worked extremely well, but that he talked too much in class. Now, one of the things that I can assure you is that like many persons that we all in here know, the trait somehow bears a cor correlation to those who go on to do well in all forms of persuasion and the gift of the oratory craft. I was one of those people. <laughs> now, in 
Now, Grantley Adams was no different. His father, placing great emphasis on the importance of attaining a scholarship to study in the United Kingdom, bore significant fruit as he would go on to gain entry to study at Oxford, an achievement, however, that his father would not live to see, unfortunately, as he passed one year prior to him commencing his studies there. This was a significant blow to Adams, as his father was both his inspiration and his guide, but was able to dig deep within. And I repeat, when I was doing the research, you can see that he was able to dig deep within, and he had a resolve and he used the principles imparted to him from his father as a springboard to go on to face both the opportunities and challenges that laid ahead. Now, having won the scholarship, Adams decided to study law and became a member of Gray's Inn at the Bar of England and Wales, and not uh, Middle Temple Prime Minister. <laughs> but just by the qualities of deep intelligence, and the ability to question and reason even the most complex of concepts, he was now ready to move on to England. His passion for great cricket that was birthed in Barbados followed him to Oxford, as he would then go on to play the game there whilst being a student. He was indeed very thrifty with the bat, and Adams did battle cricket, cricketing battle with Noel Nethersole, who later became the Minister of Finance in Jamaica. But during his time, Nethersol wasn't able to escape the wit of Adams, a wit that he had at his fingertips, who at their first encounter saw Nethersol strolling along in a manner consistent with being lost and was asked where he could find Lincoln College. Without missing a smile or a beat, Adams replied, 24,999 miles the way you are going. But if you turn back, you'd find that it is only one mile from where we are standing. That is the wit and the humor that he had. Given his love and passion for debating and deep discussion, he would go on to join and later become the president of St. Catherine's Debating Society whilst there. This passion was further piqued as he attended high-level debates held at the Oxford Union Society, where he was able to witness the intellectual debating prowess of then leader of the Liberal Party, H. S. H. Asquith, whose philosophies would later become integral and a cornerstone of, to the politics of the day in Barbados. Adams's years at Oxford were pivotal, not only from an academic and prestige perspective, but would become the foundation and cornerstone of a body of principles and ideas that would later become the tools for the uplifting of the masses of Barbados and the commencement and dismantling of the grip that was upon them at the time. Now, upon returning to Barbados in 1925, it was evident to Adams that like many other territories in the Caribbean, Barbados had seen significant change. In Grenada, on the one hand, there was Albert Marichaud, who was fighting for the advancement constitutionally. In British Guyana, there was already formed the first trade union in that area, with the calling for unity amongst the organizations fighting for the working class. In Barbados was the Democratic League, with one of its organs being a radical newspaper, namely the Herald at the time. Now at its core, Driving an agenda for the call of new conditions for the masses of Barbados was Colonel Wickham. His was one of deep radicalism, underscored by the tenets of socialism. Now Adams, steeped in the school of liberalism and pragmatism, which produced a more nuanced and pragmatic approach to achieve the same outcomes, therefore engaged in continued and often fierce debates with Wickham as to the best approaches so as to ensure that the lot of the masses of Barbados were therefore improved. Adams began to make a name for himself in the legal profession. Of course, it is not worthy for us to recall that at the time, most of the legal work coming to any thriving practice would be emanating from the status quo of the day. And as such, any lawyer, notwithstanding the overall reality of the day, would accept briefs and instructions from their clients. 
This indeed was a level of pragmatism, and of course, it provided him with the ability to take care of his now new family. Adams was married to Grace Thorne, and in 1931, their union would produce their only child, John Michael Jeffrey Manningham Adams, as we all know, Tom Adams, a great man, who would later go on in life to follow his father's footsteps to study law at Oxford, but additionally, as we know, also became Barbados's second prime minister. At the onset, Adams continued to adopt the position he had relative to the debate between liberalism and socialism. And this is an important distinction to make at this time in the lecture. However, as time grew on, particularly seeing firsthand the troubling reality of those in Barbados, his perspective and attitude relative to the intellectual positions began to change. His position, already nuanced, became more and more aligned to that of socialism, not in its extreme form, but that which allows for the marriage of democratic socialism and that of liberalism. At this point, both Adams and Wickham's perspective became more and more aligned, with Adams coming to the firm view that for Barbados to enjoy a level of development befitting of its people, there needed to be a significant check and balance on the oligarch structure of the day. Now at this point, it is worth noting that the Herald had since ceased to exist, and this led Adams to the firm view that there needed to be a voice that would reflect the unfettered voice and will of the voiceless. He was ever more resolved to show that liberalism that Asquith espoused was what was needed for Barbados in the road ahead. Now in 1934, Grantley Adams put himself forward as a candidate for the House of Assembly for the constituency of St. Joseph. I had now become openly associated with the progressive and radical movements in the country at the time. It was at this point that those in St. Joseph who believed in the cause of Adams and more broadly in breaking the backs of the monopoly that existed from the planters was broken and broken decis decisively for the first time after centuries of being uninterrupted. It is therefore very clear why St. Joseph remains the ancestral home today, and long may it be so for the Barbados Labour Party. Now, having been elected to the House of Assembly, this served as a pivotal moment in the life of Grantley Adams, as he was now in the realm where he could use his God-given gifts all in one cause, namely to make changes on behalf of the masses. It was at this point that Adams went into high gear and embodied his singular focus as to the road ahead for the many battles that would redefine the future of Barbados. Wasting no time, he used his first time in Parliament to bring focus to the plight of the then slum areas in Bridgetown. This was met by fierce opposition from opposing peers in the House, and he thus drew significant ridicule as he was now putting into action what he had long lobbied for outside of Parliament, the uplifting of the masses from the dire and less than human conditions that they were forced to endure. It was at this point that they then realized that Adams was not going to back down and that he was in the business of change for the people for the long haul. Now, during that time, there was the first disturbance of a troubled time that had taken place in neighboring St. Kitts. Realizing and being cognizant of the reality, Grantley Adams then proceeded in his intervention and stated, and I quote, I have only to remind the honorable member on my left who is making a noise intended to be disparaging to my remarks that the native Barbadian is not much different from the native of St. Kitts or that native of Jamaica. He is more patient, but even a worm will turn. There is a danger, he said, in this island that at some time or the other, the people who live under these horrible animal conditions will behave like animals. And it is the duty of the government 
to see that they live like human beings and make serious attempts at long last getting rid of these disgraceful conditions that exist in and around Bridgetown, end quote. Adams had therefore clearly signaled his intent on getting business, the business of the people and their upliftment underway. This was only but the first instance of Adams' attack on the oppressive structure of the day, as the government had recently indicated that they would introduce a housing scheme. But for Adams, he was of the firm view and belief and conviction that what was being proposed was not what was needed for the people of Barbados. To provide further context, it should be noted that the housing conditions for the majority of Barbados, according to the West Indian Royal Commission of 1938 to 1939, was deplorable at best. There was a dire reality where some 20% of the houses had only one room, whilst most were occupied by families with lots of children. Therefore, the need for significant improvement was glaring. Even by the then standards of the day, a one or two bedroom dwelling that lacked adequate facilities would therefore be deemed to be unacceptable. This was sadly also prevalent not only in Barbados, but throughout the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean, where many West Indian workers living in conditions amounted to slum housing, the things we take for granted today. And I pause here to really say the things we take for granted today in terms of our living conditions, cast your mind back to that period where Grantley Adams had to go up against a superstructure with well-oiled machinery and resources and to lobby for us to enjoy what we now enjoy. So sometimes we sit and we think, okay, this is history, but this is what our four parents had to go through. So we should never take it for granted as a country. Now, by the 1940s, Greater Bridgetown, the capital of Barbados, had a population of 80,000, more than two-fifths of whom live in a single-room housing. Families, particularly women, struggled to make the best of what they had within their means. It was typical that even the smallest of dwellings had a rare shed roof to cover what facilities there were for cooking, which they could muster to afford. Its drainage survey highlighted that within the city, only 21% of dwellings had waterborne facilities. The vast majority had what we know as pit toilets, whilst 10% use other means. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we can laugh now, huh? but again, it paints the picture. And clearly these conditions were less than humane. This was the reality of the day. And when what we can see, and clearly at the time why, now using the term of Prime Minister Mortley, mission critical for Grantley Adams was to immediately address the dire situation of the people. However, for Adams, to effectively wrestle the situation in its wider context would be to completely revamp the entire tax system of the island and to increase the income tax rate for those in the higher income spectrum. You can start, you can see now the bits of socialism coming through. Adams made it very clear that this would also be needed if there were to be advances in the financing of, <clears throat> of housing, as mentioned already, but also in the clearing of slums, the building of schools, as Minister uh, alluded to earlier, and many other necessary projects that would change the lot and circumstances of the masses. This, however, needed a laser focus in terms of strategy, as it would ultimately require a complete revamp of the status quo of the day. This would therefore mean that there would be a need to ensure that the qualifications needed for a person who wanted to vote, and thus being elected to the House, would have to change. Adams's direct calling out of the oligarchs on the prevailing conditions were now fully resonating with the people across the territory. This gave way to a rise in the tension across the island. There was no denying at this point that there was an unhappiness, nor could they question the legitimacy of his cause. In 1937, we then see a massive explosion of tensions across the region. This started in Trinidad and was followed by Barbados, British Guyana, St. Lucia, and Jamaica. 
In March of the same year, Clement Payne from Trinidad arrived in Barbados. Now at the time, he was friends with prominent Trinidadian labor figure, Uriah Butler. And it is understood that the purpose of his visit to Barbados was to help with the improving of the lot of the masses relative to their living conditions. I had set about holding some 17 meetings across the land so as to urge workers to consolidate their positions so as to improve the income employment conditions. He was very frontal in his language towards the oligarchs and those enjoying the fruits of their economic and power structure. His meetings were attracting large gatherings and he grew a significant following. However, and a big however, when the crowds began to rile up and become motivated to take action into their own hands, he would then caution them with his now famous words, educate, agitate, but don't violate. Now, on the 22nd of July, Payne was charged with having falsely and willfully declaring that he was a Barbadian when he had landed. This caused significant angst amongst the people, and during his trial, his followers would go to the courts in their numbers in solidarity with him. There was an overarching feeling amongst them that this was being done because he was opening the eyes of the masses and giving the already deep mistrust towards the establishment. This occurrence made an already bad situation extremely worse. Now at the end of the trial, Payne was convicted and was fined. He called on his followers to support his fight that he was facing with the law. Now being aggrieved by the verdict that had he had received, he asked his followers to meet him by Golden Square for a meeting. And for the young people amongst us here, oh, thank you. You now see, of course, the importance of Golden Square. And let me say here publicly that the Prime Minister and the, the government, and of course the Labour Party, must be commended for turning what was just a very normal area into the Freedom Park that we now see today. <laughs> The meeting at Golden Square was to be held so as to lead a march towards Government House the following morning, so as to express their disapproval of the court's verdict. Now, having pleaded, he said to the crowd that this should be done peacefully and orderly. Upon arriving at Government House, the march was halted by the police, and Payne was then arrested along with some of those who had followed him. Payne was then detained and served with an order of deportation. Now on the 26th of July, Payne lost his appeal and was deported from Barbados. When this was found out by his followers, as you can imagine, persons already riled up. This created the perfect storm and led to a very troubling set of events on the night of the 26th of July. His story, which later was learned to be untrue, made the rounds, namely that the child of a woman close to pain had been killed. This incense an already incense crowd. And therefore, persons began to riot in Bridgetown. This then spread across the rest of the island. This also led to some 14 persons being killed and another 47 being wounded as a result. Now it was at this point that Adams, acting as Payne's lawyer, tried to have the order of deportation rescinded. Adams was later notified by the colonial secretary that the governor had determined that the order would not be rescinded. Adams was of the firm view that had Payne not received the deportation order and later deported, what took place relative to the riots would not have occurred. And there's some lessons to be learned there. Now, emerging from the aftermath of the riots, the Barbados Progressive League was created. Soon after it was founded, the League turned its focus to what was considered its political arm. It consisted of a political council with 12 members and was created so as to provide the leadership necessary in the political field. You know, in 1940, the Progressive League campaigned in the general elections as an organized party 
with a clearly defined policy and program. Much emphasis was placed on the political education of the people at the Progressive League mass meetings and the recommendations that the Progressive League submitted to the Moyne Commission were explained in detail. Now, in addition, the party issued calls or demands for the following. One, a living wage for all workers. Two, an economic survey and census to provide accurate information as to the employment, wages, diet, and general living conditions of the people. A modern medical service, a slum clearance and housing scheme, compulsory education, free technical schools and meals for school children, free to those who could not pay. Again, we take these things today for granted. Provision for adult education, social security, inclusive of unemployment insurance, old age, pensions at 65, and health insurance. Compensation for agricultural and industrial workers injured in the course of their employment. The development of minor industries. The abolition of the plantation system and the redistribution of land to the peasants. The introduction of death duties on large estates. Higher rates of income tax. Universal adult suffrage. Let me pause here. In order for Barbados at the time to have come to the stage of getting universal adult suffrage, there was a lot that we had to go through. And it pains me that in today's society, not just in Barbados, around the world, of course there's an apathy going on here, but now we take voting per chance. But to reach here, we had to go through the mill to get there. And therefore we have, it is incumbent upon all of us, not just in the Labour Party, the other institutions in this country, we have a responsibility to our country to ensure that we take the right to vote very, very seriously. Now, I'm not, promote, I'm not saying that we should go the route of our Commonwealth sister, Australia, who for them voting is not a right but a responsibility. And just like how it is not a right to pay tax in Australia, it is mandated that you have to vote. If not, there's a repercussion. No, I'm not saying we do that, but we have to educate and re-educate our population so as to take adult suffrage seriously. Grant Lee Adams and his team fought for us to have that right. And I go on. The abolition of property qualifications for membership of the House of Assembly and the curtailment of the power of the Legislative Council to block legislation. Because at that time, the Council had blocked many of the legislation that were critical to the masses but weren't let through. And always amongst the major issues raised was that of a federation of the West Indies, which was advocated for on the ground that the future of the island was inseparably bound up, and I repeat, the future of the island was inseparably bound up with that of the whole Caribbean. We're not talking 10 years ago, we're not talking CARIFTA, we're not talking CSME, we're talking from way back when, the Labour Party, the Labour Party, in its DNA, in its blood, coincidentally, it's red. <laughs> in our DNA is the perspective that in order for Barbados to prosper, we have to do it with the region. So therefore, whoever assumes office going forward, it is something that is in our nature to do, and we have to be proud about it. Now, despite the limited franchise and massive efforts by the Conservatives of the day, the Progressive League won five of the 24 seats in Parliament. The successful candidates were, many names you know, I'm sure, Grantley Adams, Hugh Springer, Victor Vaughan, A.G. Gittins, and Hugh Cummins. Historically, Parliament was to now witness the performance of a party that was incredibly focused, and determined to support collective policy. It was later that year that the League created what was known as a Barbados Progressive League Friendly Society. And with this achievement, the structure, as originally envisioned, had now come to fruition. It must be noted that the League, with its political arm, its economic units, and friendly society, 
were not three organizations, but were one. And this was emphasized in the slogan, three units, one aim, raising the living standards of the working class. And I'm sure you can see the picture here starting to form. Additionally, the Trade Union Act was passed in 1939 and came into force in August of 1940. It was almost immediately that the economic units of the League took steps to register officially as a trade union. The rules were drafted and they were revised and adopted in, by May of 1941. And on the 4th of October 1941, the Barbados Workers' Union was registered as a union under the law of Barbados. There can be no doubt, and I repeat, there can be no doubt in the minds of anyone that the Barbados Workers' Union at its core is labor. The Workers' Union was created as one of the unions with many arms, and this was necessary to cover the island's numerous sectors. Grantley Adams and Hugh Springer, both President and General Secretary respectively of the League and the Union, saw that a confrontation was rapidly approaching. And as such, they both hunkered down to face a serious threat. The Trade Union Act gave their efforts both a legal and constitutional footing. The funds of the union were carefully used and fellow trade unions throughout the West Indies were notified. The busmen's strike of 1939 had been a disaster of epic proportions, so they were resolved that there were to be no similar errors with any labor dispute going forward. This crisis arrived with the engineers' strike of 1944. The most active arm of the workers' union was that of the engineers. Much of the union's executive council affairs in these days concerned complaints about dismissals, including those that the workers felt they were being victimized given that they were seen to be heading towards movements of trade unions. This was at the core in 1944, with some 100 plus engineers walking out of the foundries because a Turner, with some 25 years of experience of service at the Barbados Foundry and the secretary of the Barbados Workers Union Engineers Division, was fired. The employers gathered their forces with the belief that they would rout the new organization. They were confident that the trade union forces would prove as disorganized as they had been in the past. But with Grantley Adams as its leader and Hugh Springer as the organizer, the strike went on for two months. Can you contemplate in 2023 a strike of anything for two months? Can you, can you imagine the impact it would have? So place that in context. I'm not saying that we should do that now. Huh? OK. But I'm just putting it in context for you. Now, when it ended, they were victorious. And the agricultural laborers joined the Barbados Workers' Union in their numbers. And all arms were now vitalized in a significant way. With this backdrop, there became some momentous achievements of the League under Adams in Parliament. Many measures were introduced that were groundbreaking and included, but not extensive. The enactment of Workmen's Compensation Act, the increase in old age pensions, the amendment of the Trade Union Act to exempt from liability individual persons acting in the furtherance of a trade dispute, the amendment of the Education Act to provide for the appointment of a director of education, thus overhauling the modernization of the education system in Barbados, the establishment of a wages board so as to give legal sanction to agreements reached by the representatives of employees and employers, the establishment of a labor department to act as a central advisory body in labor matters, lowering the franchise from the income qualification of 50 pounds per year to 20 pounds per year, and importantly, the granting of the vote to women and to the membership of the House of Assembly in the same conditions as men. That was Grantley Adams. This also later led to the first woman to be elected to Parliament from the Labour Party, the constituency of St. Andrew, Dame Edna Bourne. Many, many firsts with the Labour Party. We can therefore see that many of the systems and the institutional mechanisms that we now enjoy today as President Day Barbados are as a direct result 
of Grantley Adams and his vision. We can see clearly that long before there was the modern phrase of gender champion, Grantley Adams bore this unofficial title. The League, with its political section, now fully styled and branded the Barbados Liberal Party, won eight seats in the House of Assembly in 1944. There was no doubt about the striking change in the political complexion of the House as a result of the reduction of the franchise qualifications. With Grantley Adams and Hugh Springer on the Executive Committee, further major feats were accomplished, and namely the commencement of the building of Erdiston College for training of teachers. How many teachers are here? How many of you know teachers? Okay, it's my point. He touched Barbados. He's long gone, but his legacy still lives. Bradley Adams. The increasing of salaries of teachers. Bradley Adams. Voting of money for adult education instructors. Okay. Penal reform. The improving of the working conditions for shop assistants. Securing for Barbadian laborers in the United States, what we call the farmer labor program. Grantley Adams. Improved organization of the then Royal Barbados Police Force, now Barbados Police Service. That was Grantley Adams. We also saw from Adams that he became president of the Caribbean Congress of Labor in 1947. And also, we look at the issue of universal adult suffrage being introduced at the time, age 21, in 1950 for the following year, in its elections. The first public health center opened in July 1953 at Spikestone. We even are now coming out the grips of COVID. Can you imagine Barbados without a public health system? Again, Grantley Adams. And I'm saying all this to you, and there's still a lot more, that when you hear dogma coming from anywhere else, you have to arm yourself with the facts of the truth. Because many times, Grantley Adams is not given his due eminence in this society. And we have to ensure that the facts remain the facts and the dogma stays out of the conversation. Long may it continue that the truth of Grantley Adams goes forward. But as I said, there's more. We also saw, as I said, in 1953, the Public Health Act, the construction of the deep water harbor. Where they can put these cruise ships? Think about it. Can you imagine Barbados today without a deep water harbor for trade and for leisure tourism? Grantley Adams, vision. What does it say? Without, I don't have eyes behind, but you can read it. Without the vision, what? The people perish. The first district hospital in Oystins, Grantley Adams. The modern tourism with the Hotel AIDS Act in 1958. And imagine, huh? we weren't an independent nation at that time, but he had the fortitude and conviction and temerity to forge ahead to do these things. And as I said, setting up of the Wages Council in 1955. Again, what we enjoy today, we clearly owe a great debt to the vision of this great man, Adams. Now, in the advent of a plan for the creation of a British Caribbean Federation, which was to create which was created, sorry, during a conference in London in 1953, and was thereafter agreed by the parliaments of Barbados, Windward and Leeward Islands, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. With the final decision being taken in 1956, two years later, after receiving the approval of the British Parliament, the West Indies Federation was therefore born. Adams became its first and only prime minister, with the Barbados Liberal Party winning four of the five available seats in its House of Representatives, with the victors being Grantley Adams, Dighton Ward, Victor Vaughan, and Gilmore Rochford. Under Adams' leadership, the Federation set out regionally to achieve a number of transformative initiatives, and these included direct taxation by the federal government, central planning for development, the establishment of a regional customs union and reform for a federal constitution, 
the creation of a federal civil service, the establishment of the West Indies Shipping Service in 1962 to operate two multipurpose ships, the Federal Maple, many of you would know, and the Federal Palm, both donated by the government of Canada. Now, they were also setting out for negotiations to acquire the subsidiary of the British Overseas Airways, BOAC, namely the British West Indies Airways, what we used to call BWE. As was seen, the issue of direct taxation was highly controversial. The Federation was not allowed to impose income tax for at least the first five years of its existence. Now, cooperation in tertiary education was consolidated and expanded during this time. Again, remember, Grant Lee Adams was the first and only Prime Minister of the Federation. These are things that the Federation did. Cooperation in tertiary education was consolidated and expanded during this time. The then University College of the West Indies, UCWI, which was established in 1948 with one campus in Mona, Jamaica, and it opened its second campus in St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago in 1960. Does that institution ring a bell to anybody? Grantley Adams, okay. The Federation, however, faced significant challenges ahead. And these included the governance and administrative structures imposed by the British, disagreements amongst the ter territories relative to policies, and particularly, <clears throat> particularly relative to taxation and central planning, and an unwillingness on the part of most territorial governments to give up power to the federal government, and, was, and lastly, the location of the capital of the Federation. Now, the final blow, sadly, which led to the demise of the Federation was the withdrawal of Jamaica, its largest member, after undertaking a national referendum in 1961 on its continued participation in the Federation itself. The results of the referendum showed the majority supporting in favor of withdrawing from the Federation. Now this was to lead to the movement within Jamaica for national independence from that of Britain. It should be noted that it also led to the now famous statement of Dr. Eric Williams, the then Premier of Trinidad and Tobago, that one from 10 leaves not, referring to the withdrawal of Jamaica and signifying and justifying his decision to withdraw Trinidad and Tobago from the federal arrangement in a short while later. Sadly, and I repeat, sadly, the Federation collapsed in 1962. This was a significant moment of sadness and pain for Adams, as he firmly believed, as I said earlier, that Barbados and the region are best served through the regional collective governance structure, enjoying a shared intellectual thought and advancing the aspirations of the people and facing the challenges head on together. However, I use this as a time to remind us that the very cause of regional integration is one that we must recommit ourselves Today, under the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, we have the CARICOM single market and economy, what I call the grandson or granddaughter of the Federation, as it were. Now, under the current framework, whomever, and this is what's very interesting here for me, whomever is the Prime Minister of Barbados, whomever is the Prime Minister of Barbados, shall have prime ministerial responsibility amongst the heads for the regional integration project. Therefore, our history shows that this is at the very heart of the Barbados Labour Party. As we only need to reflect on the significant moving of the needle of the regional integration advancements when the Prime Minister of Barbados is from the Labour Party. So think about it. Let's go back in history a bit. We need only look at the mammoth contribution made by Owen Arthur to the CSME and our very own to David Simmons in the formulation of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Labour Party. I mean, sometimes you take these things for granted, but as I said, it's in the very essence of who we are as a party. The integration project is ours, not just for ours to hold on to, but to share in Barbados, share in the region and further afield. And in today's reality, the sterling leadership of Prime Minister Morley in ensuring that this project is taken to new heights for the benefit of our region and its people is unquestionable. Even now in Geneva, I am no longer ambassador and people talk about how you 
push the CARICOM agenda, Prime Minister, and that is something that we have to be very proud of as Barbados. You therefore see that the Barbados Labour Party bo has both a national and regional duty, all at the same time, in ensuring that the regional project is advanced. Now, upon his return to Barbados from his now concluded duties as Prime Minister of the Federation, Adams observed the political landscape without hastily intervening or providing commentary at the onset. There was a new DLP administration in place, and with the then crushing 1961 defeat of the Labour Party, timing was everything. Over time, he would intervene where necessary, as he still enjoys significant love from amongst the people, especially the working class of Barbados. His wit and political instinct remained as sharp as ever. Now, as time grew on, Adams became ill. And whilst still engaging at the political level, was advised to take it a lot easier than he did before. He had endured ill health during the very tough scenarios during the Federation era. And therefore, it was felt that given the eldest statesman that he was, he needed to ensure that he could remain as healthy as possible within the circumstances. Now, in the 1961 election, the BLP team, led once again by Adams, had won 10 of the 24 seats, with the others going to Arubaro's DLP. Now, let's place that in context, because you might think, how is 10 out of 24 a good thing? This, in and of itself, was a major achievement for the party, because as Barra had asked and hoped for 22, or 23 seats of the total, it should be noted, Adams almost toppled Barrow's government, as there were some three seats that had, had he won with less than 80 votes each, it would have gone differently. It was to be mentioned that he re-entered the house, and at the time, his son, his son Tom, 66, yes, that's correct. His son Tom had been elected as a senior member of the constituency of St. Thomas. Adams assumed the role as leader of the opposition, where he was a formidable force against the then Barrow administration, particularly within the debates of the House. Members of the opposing DLP would try their utmost to ruffle Adams by making reference to his age. Whatever the statesman underscored by his wit, he would readily re remind them through his replies and interventions that he was one not to be played with. As the year 1969 marched on, Adams' ill health persisted and worsened. And in 1970, he retired from politics, which led to the by-election in St. Joseph, where the Labour Party's Lindsay Bolden was the victor. Now, during this time, he was not able to campaign like before, but significantly, his appearances throughout the constituency would be met with the shouts of Moses, for which he was affectionately called. In 1971, on the 20th of November, sadly, Grantley Adams had reached the end of his journey here on Earth. This, of course, was the end not only of an era in the history of Barbados and its political landscape, but the end of a journey of the father and architect of Barbados's democracy and liberation. His legacy, however, has left us with a clear blueprint and roadmap that in my view must be at the very core of every policy, every initiative, every manifesto, every partnership, every activity that we do as the oldest political institution in the English-speaking Caribbean. Thus, at the 85th anniversary of our institution, the moment serves as the right reminder for deep reflection, which must ultimately lead to the renewing of our passion for service. It is against that backdrop, backdrop of Grantley Adams' vision and legacy, where the challenges of the day, not only for Barbados, but the region and the global community, requires us to constantly retool at all levels, so as to do right by the people, that I want to share a few reflections of my own, that I believe are necessary given the times that we are in, 
and the road ahead that we must travel. Relative to philosophy, at the party level, it is my firm view that for the benefit of growth and transformative development, that all persons coming to public life, again, this is Chad Blackman's view, okay? All persons coming to public life in this country must have a philosophical grounding, passion for people, the calling of service, and an unrepentant dedication to achieving extraordinary things whilst remaining within the bounds of humility, and the operative word there being humility. <laughs> Specifically within the Labour Party, it must be required reading, understanding, and the conviction of the philosophy of Adams if one desires to put oneself forward to serve. At the national level, no longer can our nation afford to turn back the clock to representation that is grounded in self and to the detriment of the greater good. Governance. It's to this end that there ought to be a Grantley Adams School of Governance, Labor and International Relations, where at the political level, those aspiring to public life must go through a process of understanding the rudiments of the role of governance, representative politics, international negotiations, and the expectations thereto from the public with the ultimate aim of preparing aspirants for public life. <laughs> this is no different to any profession, where before one is able to offer themselves to the public, rigorous training must be undertaken. This ought to be a part of a mature and forward-thinking Republican Barbados. If governments in the region are to deliver for its people, and in a manner that is harmonized while still reflecting the sovereignty of the states to ex execute their domestic mandates, there will be need to have a civil service that is modernized at the regional level to meet the collective challenges and opportunities. Thus, the Grantley Adams School should also extend to regional entities thus allowing harmonization. And in the advent of online training in the modes that we're in today, this can be created and done virtually. Now, additionally, to confront the global challenges and opportunities ahead, the country will need a political structure, and I dare say political class, that is underscored by members who understand the rudiments of how small open economies work, governance and public life, the relationship between global geopolitical realities and the impact on domestic affairs, seizing economic opportunities whilst being underscored by officials and representatives who see their duty in coming to public life not as a right, and I repeat, not as a right, but as a social contract that must be renewed with the people, again, grounded in humility. Now, grounded in the spirit of creating a better life for our people, must certainly continue to ensure that we efficiently make use of technology in advancing the cause of the voiceless, and at the same time, bringing attention to their plights where they exist. This, however, requires, in my view, some reflection and some restraint. For in the world where everything is shared and liked and snapped, there is a temptation to do so in all scenarios. However, it is my view that in circumstances where sharing new projects ideas and the advancement of our people, we must do so. But where there are persons whom we have committed to create a better life for, and their circumstance at hand is one where if sharing, I repeat, where if sharing, they lose their dignity, then never must it be said that this was compromised as a result of our desire to publicize. In other words, People have dignity, and everything doesn't have to be on Twitter, social media, especially in circumstances where people are going through some tough, difficult situations. Imagine, in, let's say, in 1930s, in Adam's time, if there was social media, and you had to take the situation that was then, and you publicize it all for 
expediency. Who's gaining? Is that creating a better life for them? It isn't. And therefore, there has to be a rebalancing of what we use the technology for. Now, lastly on that point, if I use a reference from the Bible, when Jesus, at the height of performing his miracles, he would immediately say to his beneficiaries, go and tell no one. That is a service of humility in which I speak. Now, when we speak about making the country more competitive, we often talk about the skills needed for those in the private sector and the public sector. But I am of the view that if we are to see those who are elected or selected to serve us, doing so in a way that reflects a collectively, globally competitive parliament, being able to effectively raise the national psyche in our governance structure. We have to have the bold ambition, in my view, Chad's view, that by 2033, 60% of those coming to public life ought to be bilingual at minimum. So we're talking about 10 years from now, not tomorrow. You've got time. We must lead by example. Regionalism. On the issue of regionalism and integration, there can be no doubt, as I said before, that regionalism is in the DNA and fiber of the Labour Party. And thus, we must ensure that we continue to advance the cause of integration. I, however, want to proffer that whilst it is necessary in my view, it is not sufficient. For when we place the realities that we face as a nation and region, both challenges and opportunities alike, whether they be inherent realities of being small open economies, challenges associated with the climate crisis, and declining market access for goods and services to northern markets, access to affordable finance for our national and regional development, amongst many others, we need to forge ahead as a region in, in deepening integrational ties with Africa. Now, this is the second tier of the integration project in my view, and must be the cause of our generation. Of course, major steps have already been taken by Barbados with the opening of embassies and missions in the continent, and this was led by Minister Walker and Prime Minister Motley, and the recent hosting of, by the government of Barbados with the first ever African Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum in partnership with Afrexim Bank was indeed a major step in the right direction. It is, in my view, the next major development frontier that must be carved out amongst our two regions if we are to see increased growth whilst reversing many of the inherent and often unjust realities facing states like ours, and as such, for the region to grow in a manner that is consistent with our aspirations, there must be a bold decision for leaders to frame and implement over the next 10 years a CARICOM African Union free trade area where goods and services between our two regions must flow. It must also be a time of reflections for our regional academic institutions where, for example, in the study of law or international trade, on the syllabus, for example, currently, exists the study of EU law. So we're in the Caribbean. Whether you're doing law, international trade law, international trade policy, and you can master and have an elective in what's taking place in the EU. Now, fine, of course, that's a major trading partner. But hitherto, we've not done the same thing for where we've come from. And they now have the African continental free trade area. The time has now come that also our books and our education looks to Africa. Okay? And that is the sort of progression that I'm talking about. Now, relative to labor, at the core, as I said, of, of our mandate, as you can see from Grantley Adams' legacy, is that of the worker and labor. We must continually seek to empower the labor force as the challenges ahead and the new world of work will require a different skill set than unlike any other time in our history. Jobs of the future will be more knowledge-based and intellectually intensive than ever before. Technology will play a critical role in shaping of businesses that will emerge. As we move towards a knowledge-based economy, or further rather, and services economy, where our workers will, for example, be based in Barbados, but offer their services 
and ideas whole or in part, for example, in the gig economy in other jurisdictions, particularly virtually, in circumstances where they are not unionized, these are some of the challenges that we must confront whilst preparing our labor force for the future. As such, the country must prepare the labor force to meet these new realities in a way that also enhances the country's competitiveness and providing the base for us to export high levels of goods and services that are in global demand. The biggest challenge, however, for the labor force within the next 20 to 30 years, in my view, based on where I sit now, and of course we've seen it in terms of um, what has been taking place in a number of years, will be the impact of climate change on labor. It is for this reason that I have commenced working on a book soon to be published entitled Towards a Climate Resilient Labor Force in Small Island Developing States. But I go further. Given that challenge, not only in Barbados but the region, I am of the view that each Ministry of Labor ought to have a resilience development unit focused solely on ensuring that the labor force is effectively given the requisite tools to ensure that the labor market is prepared for the vulnerabilities that are inherent to SIDS. This unit under its parent ministry would need to work closely with the ministry mandated to lead education so as to ensure that the skill set needed can be created by way of training and studying. International partners such as the ILO should be approached to provide the necessary technical assistance where needed. Allow me lastly to share a recommendation that I think, given the spirit of transformative policy making, underscored by lifting the common man up, the government must be commended for the move towards the medicinal marijuana sector. This, like many other jurisdictions around the world, provides critical foreign exchange for economies and is indeed a highly regulated, strictly monitored and enforced sector. I am of the view, again, Chad's view, that there should be, that if the fees of entry into the market are prohibitive for the ordinary man, who for years have gone under the radar and often time perceive, receive penal measures, that history requires of us to consider, and as I say, consider, where persons who have hitherto been incarcerated for small amounts and have served their time, should have their records cleared and on the condition that they will use their skills in a strictly, and I repeat, in a strictly enforced and strictly monitored program where they produce and sell by way of national cooperative to be created to those companies who have the market access for the medicinal marijuana sector globally. So what you're trying to do is to lift those people from their condition in a very serious and regulated way but breaking the backs of a lot of the things that we're seeing happening now. It would therefore allow for them to gain meaningful and lawful income whilst allowing the country to export and earn foreign exchange. And lastly, it is very clear to me that we must ensure that the legacy of Grantley Adams not only comes alive in our policies, and dare I say lectures, but even given the contribution that he's made to our land, we must now ensure that the next generations of Barbadians and Caribbean citizens know of his prowess and of his transformation. Thus, our musicians, theater and film producers, as well as our fashion designers, must be encouraged to share his concepts through their craft. In other words, giving live expression to Grantley Adams. Whenever I go to Colombia or I go to Nicaragua or Venezuela, I see shirts of Che Guevara. Where is Grantley Adams, a man who revolutionized and broke the back of oppression in this country? This is the sort of transformation in real terms that I'm talking about. And thus, the U Farm of the Labour Party, this is my view, that this is a project that should earn you sleepless nights in undertaking with a vigor and passion that only you can, guided and supported by the elders of our party. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I'm of the view, and I'm sure that you've seen this evening, that Grantley Adams wasn't only a lawyer, he wasn't only a leader, he wasn't only a father, he wasn't only a son, a prime minister or a statesman, but he was indeed the embodiment and genesis 
of the majority of what we now enjoy today as a modern democratic society striving to create a better life for our people. Thank you. Granny Adams and the crafting of our nation for the times. In your presentation, you have truly crafted one that can only be described as insightful, adaptable, challenging in terms of your words and the offering of such, perhaps provocative, and of course, the call to action. You, sir, serve as a historian as well as a storyteller. And in such, as such, it now proves to be the ideal cue for me to welcome political leader and prime minister, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, to offer remarks. Thank you very much, Anton. Distinguished guests all. The coincidence of location with speaker, with purpose, cannot escape us tonight. That we are in the house that was built initially by the founders of our great party, but in particular led by the Right Excellence Sir Grantley Herbert Adams is absolutely front of mind for us. Less front of mind is that in this year, just under a month ago, had Sir Grantley still been living, he would have celebrated his 125th birthday. As we celebrate, as a party, our 85th birthday. But I want us to ask the question as we give thanks for all and Chad for reminding us that Grantley Adams was a man equal to the challenges of his time, whether we today will be equal to the challenges of our time. I speak to you today one week shy of the day five years ago when the people of this great nation chose to exercise the franchise given to them by Grantley Adams and the Barbados Labour Party to be able to bring to an end what was the longest parliamentary term in the modern history of our nation, almost five years and 90 days. And over the course of that four years, 11 months, and three weeks, I ask us to reflect on whether we have been equal to the task and to the time. Five years ago, this country barely had four weeks of foreign reserves. Today, it has in excess of seven and a half months. Five years ago, three advisories were issued against us for sewage running in the streets. Today, we have had no reports, mercifully, and we are in the process of rebuilding, having the financing and construction for the rebuilding of the South Coast sewage plant so that we don't have a future government, any government, be subject to that unfortunate set of circumstances, particularly with the fact that what 
is done at the South Coast is merely separation and not treatment. Five years ago, there were no buses across the road in Robert Street. Sanitation merely had trucks. Public works had little or no vehicles. And we set to all that we could do to the mission critical task of ensuring that we could put those things behind us. The dollar was at risk. For the circumstances of us being the third most indebted country in the world, spending almost 70 cents in a dollar in debt service out of every dollar earned. Today, our debt was reduced from 177% debt to GDP. It went down to 119%. It went back up in the deep days of COVID to 115%. So it went down to 118%, and today it is 119%, yet again. Well, it's way down. I don't quote these figures for the sake of them, but I ask us to recall what else we were able to do while facing those circumstances. That we gave two wage increases in five years when a previous government could give none in 10, or what, barely one in 10. None in eight, to be precise. That we could introduce legislation to guarantee minimum wages for the people of this country who did not have the protection of law across the board, but who benefited purely from the Wages Council to which Chad referred earlier from Grantley Adams' day. That we could rebuild the Patients' clinics in St. Joseph and St. Andrew while in the middle of mission critical and mission survival. That we could build a new accident and emergency facility that if we had not built it, we would not have been able to deal with the density requirements that were thrust upon us by the public health officials in this country once COVID hit and the QEH would have been in serious, serious trouble with respect to its capacity to service the people of this nation. That we could have restored free tertiary education within three months of coming to office. <laughs> that we could add to that and establish the National Transformation Initiative that has not only developed the citizenship module, but that has also offered 15,000 courses free of charge to Barbadians for the last three and a half years. My friends, that we could settle the awful debacle of Clico, that we could even in restructuring debt protect those who had savings bonds from the restructuring of their debt and then turn around and help those who had less than $250,000 to be removed from that class of persons who had to help share the burden with respect to the debt restructuring. As recent as the paying down of debt in the budget of this year, I'm told for some of whom have been surprised at what they have been able to receive in their bank accounts because a government does not believe in breaching its word to be faithful to the people of this country. Share the burden, share the bounty. That we could have also put behind us the awful debacle of Liat and the impact on the workers. That we, my friends, could have refleeted the transport board to have the largest electric fleet of buses in the entire Caribbean in absolute numbers and as a percentage of total transport. That we, my friends, could have built Golden Square. Understanding that the center of our town, and yes, Chad, that the story of the revolutionaries of this nation should be forever, ever, imprinted in the hearts and minds and in the faces of the people traversing Bridgetown. That we could also do so with the establishment of a botanical gardens that allows for people Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, picnic party, do whatever you want. 
creating a space for people to breathe and think and be. Because these things matter, especially when you have to have three years of restricted movement in a pandemic. These things matter to mental stability. My friends, when I spoke earlier this year, I told us that we were moving from mission critical, went into mission survival, where for effectively half of this term, <laughs> more than half of our term was stolen by COVID, by La Soufre volcano eruption, by the freak storm, and by Hurricane Elsa. But yet today we stand on the cusp of a glorious opportunity for mission transformation. And it is up to us to embrace it, or it is up to us to become a victim of circumstances by remaining stationary. This country, like the country 85 years ago, is in a world that is globally uncertain. The late 1930s saw the worst of mankind presenting itself in populism and fascism and a protection of individual interests at the expense of the majority of human population. And out of that belly came this party. And I ask us tonight whether we are equal to the task because being equal to the task means like if you're going to exercise, it's going to hurt sometimes. Like if you're going to exercise, it's going to be exhilarating sometimes. Like if you're going to exercise, it's going to require you to stretch sometimes. And it is important that we as a party understand the obligation that we have for transformation because of the legacy and the philosophical underpinnings of those early craftsmen of our faith, and in particular, of the father of our democracy. We speak all the time, and you know that I do proudly so too, of the father of independence. But we must speak proudly as a nation too, of the father of democracy, because without democracy, there could have been no independence. And we must take from him and his lesson, that spirit to embrace transformation. Today, our government is in the midst of so much. The Constitutional Reform Commission is consulting not only locally, but internationally in the diaspora. The Parliamentary Reform Commission has been sworn in and is now undertaking its work because our parliament has had no reform of any substance for a half of a century, 50 years. The last reform of our parliament in 1971, 52 years ago, related to the movement from double member to single member constituencies. And since then, only the increase in the number of seats has been the reform undertaken truly by our parliament. The Thorn Commission, the recommendations are being worked on by the Ministry of People Empowerment to bring the cabinet to pass over to the cabinet office to allow ordinary people to have a greater say in the affairs of this country in a structured way such that the importance of the vote becomes more apparent to them than us having to preach to them why it is important. And the habit that I hope will become an institutional feature of this country even after I am long gone, rubbing shoulders and parish speaks, taking the voices of the people in an unfiltered manner. Because if you cannot listen to your people and talk with your people, 
then you do not deserve to be in office. We have undertaken ambitious pension reform, both within the public sector and within the national insurance scheme, so as to ensure that 15 years from now, we do not have a bankrupt national insurance scheme. So that those of us who are working and expect to draw a pension can do so in the comfort that they shall be able to do so. We are in the midst of continued labor reform. The Labor Public Clauses Act and ensuring that there's equity and fairness in this country and the recognition of the trade union bills to add to the non-discrimination legislation that was passed by the current Minister of Labor. The acceptance of the modality of the social partnership as a fundamental precept of governance in our nation, particularly with the recent commitment to the mission economy and working together as one. Barbados succeeds when Barbados works together. We did so with the saving of the dollar. Not as government, not as labor, not as private sector, but as Barbados. We did so with the confrontation and the overwhelming, overwhelming solidarity that this country displayed during the pandemic, the first in a hundred years. We continue today to pursue considerable efforts for criminal justice reform because we will not be buoyed, we will not be thwarted, sorry, by those who believe that guns are the new drug and the new tool of trade. The penal reform continues as it was started under the last Barbados Labour Party administration under the O.N. Arthur government. In our parliament this week, the Child Protection Bill was led and goes to reforms within our parliament that with all due respect to the Parliamentary Reform Commission, we felt that we needed to undertake without waiting for the report. And it goes now to the standing select committees, one of three that we have set up. The Child Justice Reform Bill put in in the past the things that were done in a 19th century Victorian approach to crime needs to remain in the history books with Dickens and all of the rest and not to be part of a modern day Barbados. The welfare and the family reform bringing together a new institution of family services rather than the Victorian approach of welfare and the institutional-centered approach of social services that didn't function focused on the family, but focusing on the institution as a means of helping people. That work is well, well, well underway. And I was happy to see all of the persons in it in a building of camaraderie ceremony at the Botanical Gardens last Friday where the minister brought all of the workers together to begin to make sure that the work that they were doing in restructuring is also extended to the camaraderie necessary to build one united force to save our families in this nation. Not as a government, but as a nation and as a collective. The New Deal for the Disabled coming out of the Hinkson Commission shortly to come before cabinet to determine how best we protect those most vulnerable in our society. Work done for us now to execute. The reimagining of education that the Minister of Education and her team, the Chief Education Officer and others have been feverishly working, building blocks, quietly so. I believe that this will be one of the most important reforms of our generation put in, in the past not just the 80 years of the British education reform system that says take care of the top 40% and let the 60% be herded like cattle, but also reposition it at us from that awful 1661 slave code that not only sought to separate people on the basis of race, but sought to use education and other things as the primary tool of subservience without a weapon having to be drawn. 
The Barbados Youth Advance Corps established by this government to take in a thousand kids a year for two years in order to ensure that we could bring scale to the problem of getting our young people back on stream, particularly given the last decade. The reform of the transport sector that is now currently being undertaken, and may I say, the provision of gratuities to the transport board workers who in the history of the transport board had um, the pensions and gratuities had never been properly settled. The establishment of new relationship in planning and development, town planning, and tomorrow parliament will, I mean cabinet will take the new physical development plan to determine the process of consultation for the country. The silent housing revolution the digitization of our government, all who want to talk about the digital ID card system under the Democratic Labour Party, zero. Under the Barbados Labour Party, digital ID card, more than 150,000 cards distributed to the people of this nation. And why is it important? Because there must be a capacity to independently and reliably validate who you are if we are going to be able to make the case to reduce the opportunity for fraud and identity theft, particularly in the banking sector, and to make the arrangements for banking more competitive than they are. We are not happy with the length of time it takes to open bank accounts in this country. It is unacceptable, but we accept that there must be a validating mechanism to give people comfort. My friends, I could go on and on. The investments in tourism that are up to come out the ground, Indigo has started. Pendry has started. Hyatt is about to. I am meeting with the investors in Royalton later this week to determine when they will start. Minister Dugid is meeting with the Pearhead to settle the arrangements for them because they are likely to start at the same time as Hyatt so we can minimize the disruption in the center of Bridgetown as we repurpose and rebuild Bridgetown in a meaningful way as we do also with Oystens, Holton, and Spikestown. I haven't talked about agriculture and the restructuring of the sugar industry, which will see us bring to an end 50 years of subsidization for over a billion dollars. This country can no longer afford to carry that burden. This government will deal with it and make sure that we use the opportunity of renewable energy to be able to shift that burden off the people of this nation whose pockets have been supporting that industry for over 50 years. The introduction of new aquaculture and mariculture opportunities in order to be able to ensure that we can have greater capacity for food security. The improvement of agro-processing and the establishment and completion of the already International Food Science Terminal at Newton by the BIDC and Export Barbados. The new buildings going up there. The construction and cabinet approved the engagement last week for the construction of the new tissue culture lab to ensure the provision of clean planting material to ensure that Barbados can have a successful agro-processing sector in this country again. Next week we meet with the pharmaceutical sector in order to be able to ensure that the regulatory agency, the food and drug agency that we need as a precursor to the pharmaceutical sector can be fully put in place. And we have already, with the help of donors, engaged the critical people to do that work and to do the project management work for the pharmaceutical industry. They are on the ground. My friends, the construction of a new geriatric hospital that has started. And we have committed, last week I spent, over five hours with the Minister of Health and have committed to a fundamental restructuring and repurposing of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that will see an expansion of buildings both next to it and opposite on the old and more site, while also seeing the construction of a new Randall Phillips Polyclinic being planned now. That will also mean that the Lions Eye Care Center roof will be fixed and instead of us operating on minimal theaters, that all 12 surgical theaters in the QEH must now be fully operationalized. I do not come tonight to talk about what I've been hearing all week, that the numbers in the accident and emergency have literally been virtually next kin to nothing. 
because of the excellent work being done by the staff of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and the systems that we have repurposed to be able to deal with them as we move forward. My friends, I haven't started to talk about the overhaul of water and what the Deputy Prime Minister and her team are doing with respect to the augmentation and the distribution. We have already solved the problems of the people of St. Joseph in the last few years. We go now to solve the problems of the people of St. Peter and St. Lucy. And the ones for Shop Hill is virtually solved with the Lodge Hill and the expansion of the Ionics, ensuring that they and the people in Bagatelle can soon get reliable water supply. That has nothing to do with all of the new reservoirs that we have built, none of which could withstand hurricane, category one hurricanes in this country. My friends, I haven't talked about the new heritage program that is being done. And as we speak, we have a team in the Venice Biennale with the Barbados Road Project, reclaiming our Atlantic destiny, being displayed by the architect as one of the three premier projects that he has highlighted as the centerpiece of the Venice Biennale. When I received the video this morning, tears came to my eyes because that project on the land that buried 570 slaves will forever now be a place where all from across this globe can come once that monument is built and where people can recognize the critical importance of the sacrifice played by our ancestors. And that has nothing to do, I don't want the applause today talking. That has nothing to do with the digitization of our archives that will start within six weeks Barbados has the second largest transatlantic slave records in the world. And that is only after the country that caused them to be there. The United Kingdom. My friends, we haven't talked about the blue economy and all that we have done to be able to move from blue bonds, the blue first blue bonds with natural disaster clauses and pandemic clauses. The importance of the recognition of Barbados as a large ocean state and not just a small island developing state because our people must, yes, be able to swim. And I don't mean to be racist, but there was one section of our society that said the sea has no back door, so don't go in it. And the other section said the sea has no back door, so learn to swim and learn to sail. Well, I am here to say that all must learn to swim and all must learn to sail because we will conquer the seas because we have a large ocean state at the very time that the world needs what is in the ocean to save the planet, the next frontier. My friends, we are a new republic. When all said that it couldn't happen, when all tried to stop it from happening, it is not only that we have become a republic, it is not only that we have a charter of Barbados that promotes active citizenship, it is that with that, we now will settle our future constitutional arrangements, as I told you. And our voice continues now to be heard yet again, globally. Heard to be able to create the fiscal and the policy space that is so necessary to fight these battles from St. Lucy to St. Philip, from St. John to St. James, to be able to spend a little more, to do more with the retooling and repurposing of all those pipes that were put down by the British 120 years ago, but continue to burst 10 and 20 and 30 a day. They did it when they had an empire. We got a country. We have to find the money to pay for it. We have to rebuild the coral reefs to stop the salt water from getting into our aquifers as has happened regrettably already. And the relocation of people as has happened in six men's from the beach where they used to live when we were children. Or the loss of biodiversity with the loss of cobblers and sea eggs. We've been talking about it for years without realizing what was happening and linking it to the global problems. Our children must now be on the front line of this battle to save the planet. And we have done all of these things while seeking to be fiscally prudent and to get what we can. When last was this country given a grant of $80 million for anything? The Barbados Water Authority has received $80 million from the Green Climate Fund. We are in negotiations with other donors for significant grants to help us on those things that are either the result of others from overseas causing it 
or others who simply believe that our example can shape and help a new dimension globally in conversations from education right back through to climate. My friends, we have done all of this while having COVID still over 32 months from us out of four, 59 months. We've done all of this while having COVID still virtually 32 months out of 59 months. We have done all of this while being in an IMF program. We have done all of this while Bajans were restricted from movement for the first time in the independence, post-independence era of this country. But this party has done it, not because we can do it alone, but because we were able to unlock the cooperation, the confidence, and the commitment of the Barbadian people. And all, all that I ask is that we continue to work each and every day to command the confidence of the Barbadian people, to earn their respect, to solicit their sacrifice, assured that as they share in the burden, they will always share in the bounty. And that we ask them simply, not just to do as Chad asked us to do and entreated us to do most wisely, to keep educating ourselves and our people appropriate to the task, but to take our children and our families and our communities and to recognize that it is not just simply the words of a government or the words of a church that should tell you and me to take care of one another, but that it should be intrinsic in all that we do and in it, in our children, in our older people, in our working people. Because if we do that, as I said from the beginning, the last four years, 11 months and three weeks shows that when Barbados works together, Barbados wins together. God bless this country forever. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister Motley. Just before I invite the second vice chairman, Honorable Kurt Humphrey, to offer the vote of thanks, allow me to tease you a bit as we continue to share with you our activities as part of our celebrations, our 85th anniversary celebrations. And so I make mention of two upcoming events. The first to take place on the 28th of this month, that's next week, Sunday, prior to the Monday bank holiday, and that will be in the form of the rematch, the cricket rematch. You do recall Dover was a hive of activity, lots of action, and so the teams are coming together, bidding for, of course, victory, the captains being Comrade Corey Lane and Comrade Dwight Sutherland. I do believe that some members of those respective teams will still be playing. And uh, if any of you present, MPs or members, supporters, if you want to be part, you can speak to the CEO and she will, of course, inform the coordinator of the cricket match. Did I tell you where it's taking place? Hoyts Village. And that is at the Luther King and Courtney Brown Pavilion. The change, however, is that it will begin at 3.30. Is it 3.30, Pat? 3.30. It's a T20 tape ball match at 3.30. So we can expect an evening or rather an afternoon of good fun, good cricket, fellowship, some spills, and whatever else that may come with that. And I also want to let you know that in June, on the 18th, we will celebrate with the men as we host our Father's Day luncheon. And more details pertaining to that event will 
we shared with you. I now invite Second Vice Chair Honorable Kirk Humphrey to offer a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Just kidding. Just kidding. Tonight was a very good night. Please give a round of applause to all who graced the stage, please. I thank you, of course, on behalf of the chairman of the party, the National Council, its executive. I first wish to give thanks to God, as we all do, for his magnificence. We would not be here if it were not for him, and we would not get back to our home safely, which I'm hoping we all do. We first give thanks to God for his mercies and allowing us to be here. I also want to thank this wonderful Master of Ceremonies, who I think has done an amazing job. Give him a round of applause, please. A very special thanks to the organizing committee, led by Senator Pat Paris. Give her and her entire team a round of applause. And all of the staff of the Barbados Labour Party who would have been working very hard over the last few weeks and months to make sure that tonight has happened without hitch and all of the other activities that we will have the opportunity to enjoy. A special thanks as well to the Diplomatic Corps for coming out. Give, give all those members who are here a round of applause. We appreciate the support. We are all in this thing together and we are very, very thankful. I thank you as well for allowing us to come home because it's always a good feeling to be home here in this great place, the Barbados Workers Union. So to the management and staff, of the Barbados Workers' Union for allowing us to use this great place. Please, as well, a round of applause and thank you very much. I also want to thank all of you, of course, for being here. And for those who had the opportunity to grace this stage, I want to thank you, General Secretary, for your very excellent opening remarks and your introduction. Sorry, the welcome, first of all, to the, from the first Vice Chair, the Honorable Kay McConney. But tonight we are all just comrades. So Comrade McConney, thank you very much for your very warm opening remarks. A round of applause, please. Because in this Labour Party, we must give thanks and support each other. So a round of applause, please. And of course, the General Secretary, whenever Jerome graces the stage, I just smile. I, I, I happen to like him a lot, you know. Um, whenever he graces the stage, I just smile because I, I know that there is something for us to learn when he speaks. I want to thank the Prime Minister. I mean, I really want to thank the Prime Minister. I suspect this could be like Little Rick. If you went through everything, it would just be hit after hit after hit after hit. I mean, I know that we would be here probably until midnight if you were to list all the things that we were able to do in these very difficult five years. But I believe at some point, we will all tell our children, our children will tell their children that we lived in the same time as Mia Motley. And I really want to thank you, Prime Minister, as always, for your leadership and for your vision. But tonight, I feel a very special sense of affinity. and I feel a very special sense of gratitude for the words that you left us with, Mr. Chad Blackman. And Chad is still very, very young, but you can tell that Chad is tremendously bright and tremendously gifted and tremendously humble, which is the one thing that he has asked all of us to be, even as we attempt to lead. And there were many things that came to mind as you spoke of Sir Grantley, and most of them began with B, but this was just by coincidence. Brilliant. We talked about his banter. Of course, we all appreciate his bravery. And of, and of course, his many battles. And even as you associated the history with the future, the bridges that we have all built. But it is customary to think of this Barbados Labour Party as batting on behalf of Barbadians, because bees don't bat down. <laughs> and I remain thankful to be a member of this party. I think in outlining that history, you've allowed us all to associate ourselves with a true leader. In Sir Grantley, and I hope we all take from him the example that we must go forward and carry the name of Sir Grantley to everybody because we do not do enough to honor this great man. I thank you for, your, for all of the research that you've done and the comprehensive manner in which you were able to share it tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Blackman. And to those who, will, who I'm told will provide refreshments after this, I thank you as well. You are very, very important. I wish all of you God's greatest guidance. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Comrade Kirk. And uh, I would want to add to your list as I also offer thanks to the ushers, those who greeted us and who en ensured that we were warmly, warmly seated. So I thank you very much. <laughs> Refreshments will now be served. Be so kind, comrades, to allow our, our, our guests, our distinguished guests, to leave the auditorium, and then others will follow. Refreshments are being served in the Union's cafeteria. Thank you very much. Continue to enjoy the night.